We welcome you to the 2017 Military Devotional and extend our love and gratitude to each of you for the sacrifice you're making in your service to your country. Elder Larry R. Lawrence of the 70 presides and he has asked that I conduct the meeting. Elder Lawrence serves as the Assistant Executive Director of the Priesthood and Family Department and the General Authority Advisor to the Military Relations. He is also responsible for the Middle East, Africa North area, along with many other assignments. Also participating on, on the program are retired Major General Craig Larson, former Commanding General of, at Fort Douglas, and Sister An Ana Diagassini. Um, Brother Larson has served uh, on the Military Advisory Committee for the past 15 years, and Sister Diagostini served on the Relief Study uh, General Board and as a member of the Military Advisory Committee for the past five years. I'm Brother Frank Clausen, Director of Military Relations. We'll begin by singing hymn number 67, Glory to God on High, under the direction of Brother Harry Cross with Brother Herb Clawford at the organ. The invocation will then be offered by Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Jones from the Air National Guard 151st Air Refueling Wing. Our dear, kind Heavenly Father, we humbly come before Thee and thank Thee for our many blessings, Father. For the gift of Thy beloved Son, we thank Thee. Father, we are most particularly grateful for the freedom which we enjoy and the opportunity that that freedom provides to exercise our free agency to help build up thy kingdom. Father, we pray that thou might please be with and bless and protect the men and women who serve in the military. Please comfort them. Please strengthen them. Help them to know how much we appreciate and honor their service and sacrifice. We ask for these many blessings and say these things humbly in the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Elder Lawrence has asked that I provide some opening comments. Following my remarks, uh, Brother Larson will address you. We'll then be pleased to hear from Sister Diagostini. And following her remarks, Elder Lawrence will be the concluding speaker. 
The closing hymn will then be hymn number 113, Our Savior's Love, after which the benediction will be offered by Technical Sergeant Andrew Edel, also from the 151st Air Refueling Wing. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm humbled by the responsibility to address you uh, today and seek an interest in your faith and prayers that the things I say might be edifying to you and your families. After serving 28 years in the Air Force, I began serving as the Director of Military Relations for the Church on September 10th, 2001, the day before 9-11. Over the past 15 plus years, our colleagues and I in military relations have tried to ensure that you are afforded the blessings of church membership regardless of where you're serving. We have seen faithful members serve in district and branch presidencies, in Relief Society presidencies, as service member group leaders, as gospel doctrine teachers, as home teachers and visiting teachers, as branch and district clerks and executive secretaries. Thank you for your devoted service. You have blessed the lives of many during times of hardship and sacrifice. I would like to share a with you a personal experience that happened while I was serving as a, an instructor pilot at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. On most days the skies were clear and the weather was great for training uh, new pilots, while a few days each, only a few days each week did uh, adverse weather prevent us from flying. One day, however, the weather forecast suggested that we not, might not be able to complete the planned student training. Before launching any student sorties, the commander asked that me and my, my student to fly a weather reconnaissance mission to the training area to see if the airspace was usable. The training area was 60 to 100 miles southeast of the base. On departure, we entered a thick layer of clouds and broke out about 30 miles southeast of the base. And then we proceeded to the training airspace. The weather in the training area had a layer of broken clouds but there was adequate clear airspace to complete most training events. We then proceeded to the auxiliary airfield where students could practice takeoff and landings. The auxiliary landing strip uh, appeared usable, providing the weather didn't deteriorate further. We were about to call the command post to provide a weather report when we received a radio transmission from air traffic control stating that a fast moving storm and heavy rain showers were approaching Williams Air Force Base from the west. Base ops had issued a weather recall for all base aircraft. We were the only ones airborne at the time, so we contacted approach control and started our recovery. We were notified that the TAC end station had, that we used for navigation was out of commission due to a lightning strike. The instrument landing system was down for maintenance, leaving us with only one system remaining to guide us on our approach and landing. The radar ground controlled approach, commonly referred to as a GCA, was generally very reliable as long as the controller could distinguish the aircraft radar return from the weather. The controller provided heading vectors to align us on our final approach and we began our descent. Approximately seven miles on final, we entered an area of heavy rain showers. Within a few seconds, the controller made an unsettling transmission radar contact is lost. I have often reflected on the feeling I experienced at that moment. There was no backup system available for us to continue the approach. We were left on our own. Have you ever felt that you have lost contact with your Heavenly Father? Have you felt a void in your relationship with Him? He has promised, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. Seek me diligently, diligently and you will shall find me. Ask and ye shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. How can you draw near unto, God, unto Him? I find that one of the best ways to draw near to God is, to, is through con consistent study of the scriptures and the teachings of living prophets. As you do so, you will find answers to your questions. The Holy Ghost will be your companion and you will receive inspiration to help guide you through life. You will frequently receive answers to your prayers as you earnestly search the scriptures. You will have greater desire to live the gospel and be an example to others. The Apostle Paul admonished Timothy to be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, 
in faith and in purity. God will often speak to you through the scriptures. He gives correction, instruction, and guidance to bless you in your mortal journey. He promises, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. This is the spirit of revelation. Perhaps I can share an experience to illustrate this principle. In 1987, I was called to serve as a stake president of the Kaiserslautern Germany Serviceman Stake. I had, I had church experience serving in the bishopric on three high councils and as a counselor in the stake presidency. So I felt I had a pretty good understanding of church administration. After I was set apart, the visiting general authority provided some counsel to me and concluded with these words. As the stake president, you have the responsibility for the spiritual welfare of all who live within your stake boundaries. He promised me that the Lord would sustain and inspire me as I strive to fulfill my calling. After he left, I felt an enormous responsibility that weighed heavily on me. At first, I thought I might die. Then I was afraid I wasn't going to die. I was just going to feel that way for as long as I served. About a month, uh, about a month later, I was scheduled to spend five days in the United States on Air Force business. My wife had just purchased a new set of scriptures. It was a small squad, quad uh, that was bound together, uh, forming uh, with a flap on it. That was really uh, pretty neat, and I asked her if I could take it on her trip. I found that when you, you are seeking guidance from the Lord, it is helpful to read from the unmarked set of scriptures. New things will emerge from the pages that you hadn't noticed before. And I certainly needed to know what the Lord wanted me to do for the members of my stake. The flight from Germany to the United States was not full of passengers, so I had the entire row to myself. I was able to immerse myself in the Book of Mormon without any distractions. During my study, I received many impressions on the messages that would uplift and strengthen our members. I began to feel an enormous burden lifted off my shoulders as I received inspiration about what would be most beneficial for them. I learned that when, you, when we earnestly seek answers from the Lord, He often speaks to us through the scriptures. Another thing that can help you draw near to the Lord is to listen to the inspirational music. Music speaks to the heart. It provides opportunity to take time to feed our spirits and temporarily shut out the worldly things. There is a beautiful hymn titled, Take Time to Be Holy. I love the message of the lyrics. Let me share two verses with you. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with the Lord. Abide with him always and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be, thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. I hope you'll take time to be holy and listen to inspirational music. It will draw you nearer to the Lord. Finally, guard against Satan's temptations. Be especially vigilant during times when you are separated from your family. If you are a priesthood holder, live worthy of the companionship of the Holy Ghost so that you may exercise the priesthood to bless others. When I was a squadron commander of an F-15E squadron at Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho, a weapons loader on our aircraft was a Latter-day Saint named Andy. Andy had grown up in Eastern Oregon in a part member family. He became active in the church as an adult, and he and his wife were sealed in the temple while stationed at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. He was assigned to Mountain Home Air Force Base to be closer to his mother, who had suffered a heart attack. One Friday afternoon, I received a a phone call from the command post informing me that Andy and his wife and one-year-old baby had been in an automobile accident near Caldwell, Idaho. They had been driving to his parents' home to celebrate his birthday. He must have dozed off while driving, and as the car started to veer off the paved surface, he awoke and overcorrected, causing the car to roll. 
His wife, who was asleep in the back seat, suffered a broken hip and was transported to a, the hospital in Caldwell, along with their baby, who wasn't injured. Andy had been thrown from the vehicle and was life lighted to a hospital in Boise with life-threatening injuries. I left immediately and drove to Boise. Shortly after I arrived at the hospital, the neurosurgeon who had just operated on Andy met with me in the emergency room and explained that Andy had suffered the most severe head injury he had ever seen. He said, if there are any family members who want to see him alive, they need to come now. He didn't believe that Andy would survive the night. Assessing the situation, I realized that his wife and child who were hospitalized in Caldwell would not be able to see Andy. So I decided to contact his parents to inform them of his condition. His sister, who was staying with them while her husband was deployed to Diego Garcia in the, India, in the Indian Ocean, answered the phone. And I conveyed to her what the neurosurgeon had told me. She then asked me if I was a member of the LDS Church. I said, yes, I am. She then said, will you go and give Andy a blessing that he will live? I paused for a moment, sensing her profound faith in the power of the priesthood in preserving her brother's life. I told her I would. As I hung up the phone, the flight surgeon walked into, our flight surgeon walked into the emergency room. He was also a member of the church, so I asked him if he would assist me in giving Andy a priesthood blessing. We found a room where we could pray to know the will of the Lord. This family needed a miracle, and as we prayed, we had a reassuring feeling that the Lord was mindful of them. After our petition to the Lord, we gave Andy a priesthood blessing that he would live and in time would recover from his injuries. He awoke from a drug-induced coma after three weeks with lots of questions. Eventually, Andy was released from the hospital on his way to recovery. You never know when you will be called upon to exercise the priesthood to bless others. Remember, power in the priesthood comes when you strive to live righteously. May you always maintain contact with God. Draw near unto Him, and He will draw near unto you. Become familiar with the way He speaks to you and answers your prayers. I know as you earnestly study the scriptures and take time to be holy by listening to inspirational hymns and music, your ability to resist Satan's temptation will increase. Be faithful to the covenants you have made and always be worthy to ask God in faith that he will bless and watch over your family. I bear witness that God loves you, that he is mindful of you and your personal needs. And I know and I do so humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is an honor for me to take a few minutes today and express my love for each and every one of you. I would like to take a few minutes today to discuss what I feel is an important topic that each one of you deal with on a daily basis, that being adversity. Adversity will be a constant and occasional companion for each of us throughout our lives. We cannot avoid it. The only question is, is how we will react to it. With our adversities, will our adversities be stumbling blocks or stepping stones? Father Lehi ta taught his son Jacob that in order to bring to pass righteousness, the Lord's plans allowed for wickedness. In order for God's children to appreciate joy, they must also be subject to misery. To accomplish the purposes of God, there must needs be an opposition in all things. Our adversities are part of that opposition. Elder Howard W. Hunter explained the principle in a general conference many years ago. Some adversities are individual. Others are common to a large number of our Heavenly Father's children. During the past decade, there have been many examples of large-scale adversities affecting tens or hundreds of thousands or millions. Only a few can be mentioned. 
In addition to wars in many nations, we have had earthquakes in Japan, California, China, Armenia, and Mexico, hurricanes or tornadoes in Florida and central United States, volcanic eruptions in the Philippines, flooding in India and North America, and famine and pestilence in Africa and elsewhere. These huge catastrophes are tragedies, but they may have another significance. The Lord uses adversities to send messages to his children. Isaiah prophesied that in the last days, the Lord would visit all nations with great natural disasters. In modern revelation, the Lord speaks of calling upon the nations of the earth by the mouth of his servants, and also by the voice of thunderings, and by the voice of lightnings, and by the voice of temptations and by the voice of earthquakes and great hailstorms, and by the voice of famines and pestilence of every kind. The Lord also tells those he is called to teach the gospel. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verses 89 to 91, the Lord tells us, quote, After your testimony cometh the testimony of earthquakes, and also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings, and the voice of lightnings, and the voice of tempests and the voice of waves of the sea, leaving themselves beyond their bounds. And all things shall be in commotion, and surely men's hearts shall fail them, for fear shall come upon all people." Close quote. Surely these great adversities are not without some eternal purpose or effect. They can turn our hearts to God. Nephi was told that the natural enemies of his descendants would be a scourge unto thy seed, to stir them up in remembrance of me. The idea of a scourge to cause people to remember God reaffirms the familiar teachings in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Even as adversities inflict mortal hardships, they can also be the means of leading men and women to eternal blessings. Such large-scale adversities as natural disasters and wars seem to be inherent in the mortal experience. We cannot entirely prevent them, but we can determine how we will act to them. For example, the adversities of war and military service, which have been the spiritual destruction of some, have been the spiritual awakening of others. The Book of Mormon describes the contrast, quote, but behold, because of the exceedingly great length of the war between the Nephites and the Lamanites, many had become hardened because of their exceedingly great length of the war. And many were softened because of their afflictions, and insomuch that they did humble themselves before God, even in the depths of humility." Close quote. I read of a similar contrast after the devastating hurricane that destroyed thousands of homes in Florida some years ago. A news account quoted two different persons who had suffered the same tragedy and received the same blessing. Each of their homes had been totally destroyed, but each of their family members had been spared death or injury. One said that this tragedy had destroyed his faith. How, he asked, could God allow this to happen? The other said the experience had strengthened his faith. God had been good to him, he said. Though the family's home and possessions were lost, their lives were spared and they could rebuild the home. For one, the glass was half empty. For the other, the glass was half full. The gift of moral agency empowers each of us to choose how we will act when we suffer adversity. Our adversities can be the means of obtaining blessings unobtainable without them. Young Jacob had suffered afflictions and much sorrow in his childhood. But Lehi assured his son that God shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy good. After the saints suffered severe persecutions in Missouri, the Lord gave this beautiful promise. In Doctrine and Covenants section 98, verses 1 and 3, the Lord speaks, quote, Fear not, let your hearts be comforted. Yea, rejoice evermore, and in everything give thanks. All things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good." Close quote. A few years later, the Lord spoke similar words to the anguished prophet Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail. 
My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then if thou endure it well, God shalt exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. How can adversities be for our good? In Exodus chapter 1, verse 12, the Lord tells us, quote, The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Close quote. The Book of Mormon contains many similar examples of how whole groups of people can be blessed through common adversities. When the wicked Nephite priests enslaved the faithful people who followed Alma, the Lord blessed them with extra strength as a witness of how he did visit his people in their afflictions. In Mosiah chapter 24, verse 15, we read, And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease, and they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. When Alma the younger preached to the Zoramites, the rich and the proud would not listen, but many who were poor heard his message. Alma saw that their afflictions had truly humbled them and that they were in a preparation to hear the word. Later, during the long wars reported in the last chapters of the book of Alma, many of the Nephites and Lamanites were softened because of their afflictions, insomuch that they did humble themselves before God, even in the depth of humility. As a result, Helaman and his brethren were able to preach to them, baptize them, and reestablish the church in their land. With the blessings of God, what seems to be adversities can be turned to the benefit of his faithful children. For example, on a large scale, we can look on television as an advers adversity because it brings ugly programming into our homes and undercuts our standards of behavior by making wickedness seem accepted and popular. But television is also a medium we are using to spread the glorious message of the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Many other such examples could be given. We may look on the shortage of money and struggle to find rewarding employment as serious adversities. I remember such experiences and feelings, and I am unpersuaded that relative poverty and hard work are greater adversities than relative affluence and free time. You are all familiar with the cycles reported in the Book of Mormon in which prosperity led to complacency and pride and spiritual downfall and in which depriva deprivations led to humility and spiritual growth. I believe that the easy way materially usually is not the best way spiritually. For many, though not all, material wealth and abundant free time are spiritual impediments. In her fine book called Adversity, Elaine Cannon shared this valuable example. An old cowboy said he had learned life's most important lessons from heifered cows. All his life he had worked cattle ranches where winter storms took a heavy toll among the herds. Freezing rains whipped across the prairies. Howling bitter winds piled snow into enormous drifts. Temperatures might drop quickly to below zero. Flying ice cut into their flesh. In this maelstrom of nature's violence, most cattle would turn their backs to the ice blasts and surely drift downwind mile upon mile. Finally intercepted by a boundary fence, they would pile up against the barrier and die by the scores. But heifers acted differently. Cattle of this breed would instinctively head into the windward end of the range. There they would stand shoulder to shoulder facing the storm's blast, heads down against its onslaught. You always found the heifers alive and well, said the cowboy. I guess it's the one greatest lesson I ever learned on the prairies, just face life storms. Similarly, if we face up on our individual adversities or hardships, they can become a source of blessings. God will not give us adversities we cannot handle, and he will bless us richly for patiently doing the best we can in the circumstances. The Apostle Paul demonstrated his understanding of that principle and provided a wonderful example of how to act upon it. 
Paul had what he called a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. He prayed for the Lord to take that thorn from him, but the Lord replied, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Having received that answer, faithful Paul said he would glory in his infirmities. Therefore, he said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. As the Lord explained to the prophet Moroni in Ether chapter 12, verse 27, I quote, I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak, weak things become strong unto them. You all face adversity on a daily basis. It may be the terrible war that continues to rage in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. It may be other locations where you are equally tested with adversity. Regardless of where you are located, you need to know that our Father in Heaven loves you. He is keenly aware of your challenges and holds His arms open to bless you for your challenges. These blessings are made possible because of the resurrection and the atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know and testify to the truth of Alma's teachings found in Alma chapter 36, verse 3. Whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up at the last day. I bear witness to these things that I know that God lives, that he has restored his true church to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I recently read an article in the church news stating something you probably already know, that the ongoing global war on terrorism has been waging for more than 15 years. That's longer that, than the combined duration of World War I, World War II, and the Korean War. And second, less than one half of 1% 1 of the United States population is actively serving in the military. That makes for something of a national disconnect. Deployments, long separations, and the uncertainties of war are day-to-day -day realities for men and women in the armed forces and their families. I became familiar with deployments, separations, and the uncertainties of war when our oldest son, a former Navy SEAL, was deployed once to Iraq and twice to Afghanistan and as our second son still is in special operations. Additionally, when I served in the Relief Society General Board and acted as the liaison between the Relief Society and military relations and chaplain services, I had many opportunities that helped me better understand the realities of everyday life of deployed military men and women and their families. Like you, I love this gospel. And I know that the people in the military are often making a critical contribution to the unfolding of God's designs on the earth on these latter days. I am grateful for you and your families whose contribution is just as important. I pay tribute to you and feel privileged to be associated with you. I feel honored to have any part in military related matters. And like you, I know that this privilege and honor comes with a price. The feeling associated with the satisfaction to be involved in a good cause and doing something relevant in the world is frequently followed by times of great uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. I remember a time when at the end of a long and unusually difficult and devastating deployment for one of our sons, I began to count the days, hours, and minutes for him to come home. When our children were serving their proselyting missions, we also counted the days for them to come home. But as you know, in the military, this countdown has a different meaning. During this specific deployment, even though he never disclosed classified or improper information, as his mother, I could sense in talking to him the weight of his responsibilities 
and how critical and dangerous his team's mission was. Even I had not had opportunities to video conference or talk to him, I could feel it in my bones how deep in harm's way he was. In a somewhat miraculous way, he made a home in safety. But despite our good fortune, the anguish I felt and the fear that possessed me those days is something I can still recall. As I thought about this experience, my mind drifted back to the day I got an expected call from my brother telling me that my mother, whom I was supposed to meet for lunch in a couple of hours, had just passed away. At this time of my life, I was so close to my mother that I had completely convinced myself that she was going to live forever because I could not bear the thought of not having her around me. I was shocked and unprepared for the news I received. The days that followed were, of course, full of deep, deep sorrow. And in an attempt to alleviate my pain, I knelt down and pleaded with my Father in heaven for his blessings of comfort. I started my heartfelt prayer asking for guidance on what to pray for in that moment. And I decided to completely forget time and was determined not to end that prayer until I had received some degree of comfort and reassurance from him. I began pouring out my heart in all sincerity, and the thought came into my mind that I could humbly ask if Heavenly Father would grant me the blessing to feel what she was feeling on the other side of the veil. What happened next was something I was not expecting. My heart and soul were filled with unspeakable joy. In my mind, I could see my mother surrounded by her parents and other family members. And in my heart, I could feel the joy she was experiencing. The rejoicing in my heart was so great and intense that I did not have physical strength to continue praying. I, I could not longer handle it and I had to stop praying. Later, when I tried to explain to my husband what I felt, I remember Ammon, the son of Mosiah in the Book of Mormon, when he and his brothers met Alma after they had finished their mission. Now, the joy of Ammon was so great, even that he was full. Yea, he was swallowed up in the joy of his God, even to the exhausting of his strength, and he fell again to the earth. I know for sure that this was one of the most difficult times of my life, but I have never felt joy the way I felt in the middle of the sadness of that occasion. Not only I felt indescribable happiness, but I was filled with light. One of the darkest hours of my life was also filled with the greatest joy and light. So I began to wonder, how is it, how is it possible that we can have positive outcomes in life and be filled with fear, and in other times experience the very worst and be filled with light and peace. And I realized that what really determines the way we feel are our thoughts and beliefs, and that we are permitted to control the things we choose to believe. For behold, you're free. You're permitted to act for yourselves. For God hath given unto you a knowledge, and he hath made you free. If we believe in the words of Christ and allow ourselves to be filled with His Spirit, we can, as Elder Holland said, dwell within a personal fortress, a veritable palace of perfect peace, regardless of, of external circumstances. In a Christmas devotional last year, Elder Holland also commented that we live in a world today where we have to create our own peace. Notice that he did not say there is no peace in the world, but his comment was very much in alignment what, with what he had said earlier, that we can create our own peace as we dwell within a personal fortress, a veritable palace of perfect peace if we come unto Christ. We have been told on several occasions that we're living in enemy territory, and as civilians, we sometimes forget that, but those in the military are blessed with an increased gift of awareness. No, not all is well in Zion, and yes, we live in enemy territory, but we have been given the power to create our own peace and dwell within a personal fortress. You who make up a small percentage of one half of 1% are blessed with an opportunity to clearly establish righteous priorities, whether you are the one deployed or the family of the one deployed, because you know better than most that we are living 
in enemy territory. Recently, I was unusually overwhelmed with some challenges I was facing in my life. As I knelt down to pray, I began to list in great details all my problems to my Father in Heaven. Most of these problems and challenges were quite serious. As I began to pour out my heart to my Father in Heaven, I began to visualize in my mind a wall of water that kept increasing with each new problem. In my mind, this wall of water was as tall as the mountains close to my home, and I felt that I was no longer able to shoulder this wall of water that represented my sorrows and, and problems. I felt as if I was ready to succumb and be engulfed and completely overtaken by these menacing waves. I was feeling weak. And when I felt that I no longer had the strength to continue, I heard these words in my mind. I know what you're going through. As I heard that in my mind, I could also feel an outpouring of love. And I felt as if I was being embraced in a warm blanket of love and well-being and was surrounded by light. And this voice continued, because you are clean and you have been faithful to your covenants, you have been given power from on high to command these waters to subside. I did exactly that. I commanded the waters, which were a representation of my problems, to subside. And at the same time, I could see the water coming down until the ground was dry and I was full of strength, standing in full command of the situation. The enemy was trying to convince me that there is no peace on earth, that there is no hope, that I was weak and not worthy of God's love, and that I and everything around me was doomed to fail. I was reminded by Elder Holland that regardless of where we are in life, the Savior understands us because He is not an abstraction. He is a breathing, living Son of God. Sometimes we think that we have gone too far, sinned too much, or have been away for too long, and somehow can come back into the circle. But again, Elder Holland reminds us that no one can fall lower than the light of Christ shines. We all live in a complex world full of turbulence, unknowns, and challenges. And sometimes I feel like we're living in a time when, to borrow from a saying from my son's team, the only easy way, the only easy day was yesterday. But as President Nelson reminded us this last general conference, our Heavenly Father never intended that we would deal with the maze of personal problems and social issues on our own. Fortunately, we have the teachings of the Holy Prophets and the words of eternal life. The scriptures are full of reminders that we have good reason to trust in our Savior, for as Nephi declared, He is mightier than all the earth. His promises of power, protection, and strength are too numerous to quote. The scriptures are full of them, but here are a few examples. When in Isaiah, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The scripture in John, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Scripture in Alma, whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials, in their troubles, and their afflictions. And more recently in Doctrine and Covenants, I will go before your face, I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts and my angels round about you to bear you up. How grateful we can be that regardless of the circumstances around us, we can come unto Him and choose to retire our personal fort in our personal fortress and palace of perfect peace and feel His love for us. It is the power in the spirit of love and a sound mind and not the spirit of fear that will enable us, enable us to recognize, trust, and have faith in our Heavenly Father's goodness, His divine plan, His gospel, and His commandments. I end with the words spoken by President Dieter F. Uchtdorf in this last general conference. In our homes, in our places of business, which in your case could be in a field or a land far away, in our hearts, let us replace fear with Christ's perfect love. Christ's love will replace fear with faith. And he continued, there is no fear in Christ's love. Brothers and sisters, dear friends, God knows you perfectly. He loves you perfectly. He knows what your future holds. He wants you to be not afraid, only believe and abide in his perfect love. 
of these things I bear witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Over the last three years, I've had the opportunity to be the priesthood advisor to the Military Relations Division at Church Headquarters. This responsibility has allowed me to work closely with Frank Clausen and his team. They are awesome. I have been blessed in, uh, to associate with General Larson, Sister Diagostini, and the General Military Advisory Committee chaired by Elder Robert Oaks. Sitting twice a year with seven generals as they brief each other on world affairs has been an unforgettable experience for me. We send out a welcome letter to each new LDS recruit and have received responses from many of them. From reading your letters, I have come to realize that active duty brings a person face to face with what he really believes about God, about life, and about the afterlife. Every year, hundreds of non-member recruits are converted and baptized into the church during their basic training experience, and many are baptized immediately thereafter. These truth-seeking men and women find answers to life's greatest questions when they join the military. They are assisted by the valiant efforts of military relations couples and also by the examples of fellow recruits who truly live their religion. At the same time, many LDS recruits who have drifted away from church activity find their way back to, to the church during this time of intense challenges. Life's meaning takes on a new level of importance in the pressurized theater of military service. President Monson has consistently taught that life's greatest questions are these. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where do we go when we die? The answers to these questions have been restored to the earth thanks to the prophet Joseph Smith. How blessed you are if you know the purpose of life. So few people on the planet understand why we are here. Only about one in every thousand. I would like to focus for a few minutes on the answers to these important questions. I hope I can add to your understanding today. Let's think for a minute about where we came from. Think back to the time before we were born, when our spirits lived with our Heavenly Father. We could feel His love, His perfect love for us. He was all-knowing and all-wise. Our Heavenly Parents already had resurrected bodies of flesh and bones, and we wanted to grow up to be just like them. That's why our spirits left heaven to come to this earth. It was like leaving home to attend school. We thought of the planet Earth as a great university campus far away from the home where we had been brought up and nurtured by our heavenly parents. Coming here was not only a way for us to gain a body and valuable new experiences, but a chance to apply what we had already learned in heaven and to be tested. Elder Neil Maxwell pointed out that our life is very, very brief compared to eternity. He said that earth life is like a parent dropping a child off for a day at school. Then he added, but oh, what a day. The scriptures teach that a day in God's time equals 1,000 years on the planet earth. So if you do the math, you will discover that even if you should live to be 90, you will been, have been gone from your heavenly home just a little over two hours in God's time. Our lives really are brief. The test will be over before you know it, so don't get distracted. If you're 30 years old, you have been gone from heaven for less than half an hour. From this eternal perspective, a 12-month deployment lasts only one and a half minutes. When we were spirit children, we looked forward to our experience on earth, but it still must have been hard to say goodbye to our, heaven, our Father in heaven. The prophet Harold B. Lee said, I can imagine that as each one left, there was a sadness of heart. Perhaps they held a funeral service there, comparable to what we hold here. Maybe someone stood at the pulpit and re-preached the instructions of the Father. Perhaps he comforted those who were a bit lonely at the passing of a loved one. Even though we were excited about the opportunities that lay ahead, it was only natural to be a little nervous and afraid of the unknown. Perhaps the scariest part was realizing that it was possible to fail. We didn't want to disappoint our Heavenly Father, for He loved us so much. We knew that if we failed completely, we would never be comfortable in His presence again. On the other hand, if we did our very best, we could become like Him. But nothing ventured, nothing gained, 
and so we dared to try. Perhaps the speaker at our farewell in heaven said something like this, Don't be afraid. Have faith in Father's promises. It won't be easy, but growth is never easy. The memory of heaven will be taken from you, but you will never be alone. Though you won't remember the face of God, He will always remember yours. He will be watching and hoping to hear from you. And don't give up when you make mistakes. Always remember our brother Jesus, who has offered to help us repent. If you do your best, all that you can do, the grace of God will bring you home again. We each knew Jesus and trusted him. The very mention of his name gave us courage. Soon after our farewells were said in heaven, we left our first home. Our mature adult spirits entered into tiny infant bodies. Mortal parents on earth rejoiced to welcome each of us. New arrivals, fresh from heaven. They were awed by our innocence. Every student in this school of mortality makes his share of mistakes. Each of us experiences pain and heartache too. Sometimes we feel a little homesick for heaven, but overall we are glad we came because we are learning so many new things all the time. One of the best things about earth life is that we can learn how to live as part of a family. This is crucial to our education if we want to become like God. Living with our earthly families, we can practice living, loving, serving, and forgiving others. Whether we realize it or not, we are signed up to take many classes on this earthly campus. One important class is self-control. Like family living, this is a lab class. We need to learn how to discipline the incredible physical bodies that we have been given. We studied about it before we came here, but things are always easier in theory than in practice. We are also enrolled in core classes such as how to trust in the Lord and how to be patient in times of trouble. I like to think that the Lord met with each of us personally to create our class schedules, designing the very best curriculum for our individual progress. Sometimes we feel frustrated when the testing seems more difficult than we can handle. But God has promised that he will, we will not be tested above that which we are able to overcome. In other words, we are stronger than we think. Knowing that we are God's children, attending school away from home, helps to explain many things about our lives. It explains why funerals conducted by this church are more like graduation ceremonies. At LDS funerals, we honor those valiant spirits who have kept the, their, the commandments served others, and finished the course. After graduation, when a spirit is released from his mortal body, he is ushered immediately into the world of spirits. This will only be a temporary home, a place of preparation and waiting to be resurrected. The spirit world is not a faraway place. It is right here around us, but in a different dimension. You see, the earth is a living thing, and every living thing has a spirit. The spirit world is actually the spirit of Mother Earth. Just like our spirits are inside of our bodies, the Savior taught that the spirit world is located in the heart of the earth. Brigham Young liked to call it the next room or the next apartment. Our loved ones who have passed on are not far from us. Joseph Smith said that as soon as our spirit leaves our body, we are shaking hands with our family and friends on the other side. Brigham taught that the spirit of the righteous and the spirits of the wicked all go to the same world of spirits. However, within that world, spirits are separated into different groups, depending on their level of progression. The scriptures speak of two major divisions, paradise and prison. Within these two divisions, people are gathered with others who are the most like them. For example, in one part of spirit prison, there are good people who are waiting to be taught the gospel. In another part, there are wicked people suffering for their sins because they died in their sins. I've heard the spirit world compared to a big city like Los Angeles. In one part of LA, there are there's a beautiful temple where only the worthy can enter. In another part of Los Angeles, there are universities where those who are accepted can attend classes. And in the same city, there are prisons where lawbreakers are imprisoned and cannot be freed until they have paid their debt to justice. Likewise, in the spirit world, there is paradise where only the worthy can enter. There are schools of learning where the gospel is being taught. And there's a place called spirit hell where unrepentant people cannot leave until they have paid for their sins. Naturally, we are most interested in the part of the world 
and spirit world called paradise. That's where we want to go. When a faithful saint passes away and his spirit arrives in paradise, he is given an assignment to help and serve others. Thus, church members who pass on the other side continue to build the kingdom of God. And at the same time, they continue to grow and progress. In the biography of Elder Russell M. Nelson, he shares an amazing experience recorded by his grandfather, Andrew Nelson, in 1891. I quote from this grandfather. On the night of April 6, I had a strange dream or vision in which I saw and conversed with my father, who died a few months before. Though some may scorn and laugh at the idea of such a visitation, yet I feel assured that it was real. I was in bed when father came in to the room. He came and sat on the side of the bed and said, Well, my son, being you were not there when I died, I received permission to come and see you for a few minutes. I answered that I was very glad to see him. And then I asked, What have you been doing since you died, Father? Three days after I died, I received my commission to teach the gospel. Since then, I have been traveling with my missionary companion. You cannot imagine how many spirits there are in the spirit world that have not yet received the gospel. But many are receiving it, and a great work is being accomplished. Will all of the spirits believe you, Father, when you teach them the gospel? I asked. No, they will not. Father, can you see us at all times, and do you know what's going on down here? No, my son. I cannot... Ha I have not other things I need to do. I can't go when and where I please. There is much more order here than in the other world. I have been assigned a work, and that work must be performed. Father, Father, is it natural to die? My son, it is just as natural to die as it is to be born, or for you to pass through that door. End of quote. The church in the spirit world is huge and very well organized. There are many more members there than we have here. President Wilfred Woodruff taught that priesthood leaders meet in councils and continue to issue callings, just like they do on earth. Good men and women are continually being called home to serve in the world of spirits. This is why Alma asked the question, if you were called to die at this time, have you been sufficiently humble? If people are called to die, then the question may be asked, what are they called to do? President Joseph F. Smith was shown a marvelous vision of the spirit world in 1918. He beheld that the faithful elders of this dispensation, when they depart from mortal life, continue their labors in the preaching of the gospel. President Smith later explained that righteous women who have been endowed are also authorized to teach the gospel in the spirit world. But missionary work is not the only work of the church beyond the veil. There are many callings for which capable people are needed. Some are called home to be teachers, some to keep records, and some to serve as divine messengers or angels. President Joseph F. Smith taught that those who pass away may have a mission to come given to them to visit their relatives and friends upon the earth. He said, and I quote, they bring messages of love, of warning, and of instruction to those whom they have learned to love in the flesh. President Smith experienced these ministering spirits firsthand. His own parents passed away while he was still a boy. He was only five years old when his father Hiram was shot at Carthage. When his mother Mary Fielding Smith died when he was only 13, it left Joseph to care for his young sister. These two orphan children were given sacred experiences that let them know they were being directed by their angel parents from the other side of the veil. One of the young sister missionaries who served with us in Russia told me that her mother had passed away before she left on her mission. When she was set apart for her stake president, promised this sister that her angel mother would be at her side while she was serving. She testified that direct help and influence from her mother's spirit had comforted her, comforted her many times. I assure you that angels also direct and protect righteous soldiers who are faithful to their covenants, making sure that they are not taken before their time. The spirits of the righteous are received into a state of happiness which is called paradise. In the scriptures, it is called a state of rest, but that can easily be misunderstood. The saints will be plenty busy there, so it won't be a rest from work, but it will be a rest from Satan and from the constant negative influence of Satan. If we qualify for spirit paradise, the devil can never lie to us or discourage us or tempt us again.
Never. We are home free. Brigham Young explained, if we are faithful to our religion, when we go into the spirit world, the fallen spirits, Lucifer and the third part of the heavenly host that came with him, will have no influence over our spirits. Then Brigham said, is not that an advantage? Yes, because all the rest of the children of men who have died are more or less subject to these evil spirits, just as they were while here in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to being free from Satan forever. That is the reward of the righteous while they await the resurrection. And who are the righteous? Those people who have been baptized and are faithful at the time of their death. For this reason, the scriptures warn us not to procrastinate the day of our repentance. We need to be walking on that straight path when we die. This understanding should motivate us to rescue our brothers and sisters who have drifted from the path. It should also motivate us to perform baptisms for our ancestors in the temple. Once these deceased spirits accept the gospel and are baptized by proxy, they are set free from spirit prison and from the influence of Satan. They are then ushered into spirit paradise to enjoy true peace at last. Included with the righteous in spirit paradise are all the children who died under eight years old. As the Gospel Principles Manual teaches, all spirits are in adult form. So no matter what age we are when we die, our spirits will look like adults. Do you remember Jedediah M. Grant? He was the father of Heber J. Grant and a counselor to Brigham Young. President Grant was privileged to visit Spirit Paradise for two nights before he finally died in 1856 at the young age of 50. He shared his observations with the other members of the First Presidency when they came to see him in his sickbed. President Grant observed that people in the spirit world were not floating around on clouds and playing harps, as some have supposed. Instead, they were busy and energetic and productive, working in a very orderly way. He was most impressed with how perfectly everything was organized. He described the buildings in the spirit world as being more beautiful than anything he had ever seen. The most ordinary building in paradise was more impressive than Solomon's famous temple. President Grant was impressed with the lovely gardens that he saw there. The flowers were extraordinary, with a variety of colors growing on a single stem. President Grant explained that the entire spirit world was bathed in a beautiful golden light. The prophet Brigham Young taught us about travel in the spirit world. He said that spirits move easily there like lightning. If we want to visit Jerusalem or some other place after we die, and if we receive permission, we can be there immediately, looking at its streets. Here on earth, the Lord has asked us to hasten the work of salvation. President Monson has assured us that in the spirit world, the saints are hastening the work of salvation also. They are busily teaching the gospel and preparing for the Savior's second coming. At that great day when Jesus returns to the earth, all the faithful spirits in paradise will be resurrected with glorious celestial bodies. Imagine their excitement and anticipation as the time for his coming approaches. I testify that God loves us and wants us to become like him. I pray that each of us will be faithful to the end of our lives, no matter what tests may come our way. May we graduate from, with honors from this school of mortality and look forward to a joyful reunion with our family in heaven. Try to imagine the warm reception we will receive from those spirits for whom we have, been, have performed ordinances in the temple. They will surely want to greet us and thank us personally when we arrive. It is my prayer that as we continue to share the gospel with others, all of God's children may come to know the answers to life's greatest questions. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the opportunity we've had to hear these inspired messages and ask that Thy blessings be upon us as we face adversities both at home and abroad. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.